Right, thank you very much. I uh, want to welcome Brian Moynihan, who is the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Uh, Brian, big day for the banks. We've heard from a lot of reports, and there have been a, a little bit of confusion as people try to look through these numbers because there are some big charges that have get, gotten handed out to every one of the banks, FDI assessments and other things that have been included. Um, on the earnings per share, you came in at 70 cents. That was above expectations, but it was down from last year. But why don't we dig beneath some of these charges and try and really get at what's happening with the bank? Um, why don't we walk through segment by segment? Maybe we could start with uh, sales and trading, because revenue there was up by about 3 percent. What's happening? Well, uh, Beck, it's good to be here, and uh, we'll see you next week uh, over in Switzerland. But yeah, if you look at sales and trading, Jim and the team have done a good job. For the year 23 versus 22, up 7 percent. This quarter up uh, a bit. Um, we are down a little bit in fixed income this quarter, but year over year it's up 11 percent. So things have been flow. They've made money every trading day. They've done a great job. They've gained market share. The equities, this business uh, came up uh, stronger um, in the fourth quarter. And but year over year is relatively flat. So they've done a good job. And then when you move over to the investment bank and corporate banking side, loans grew. Uh, deposits grew in that area. And then importantly, our investment banking fees, it seems, performed better than than some of our peers. And, and Matthew Cote and our team have done a good job there uh, of running the whole uh, commercial bank, uh, the uh, global corporate investment bank uh, business and also help, helping uh, on the investment banking side. So we feel good about our markets based businesses. Uh, in terms of consumer banking, revenue there was down by about 4%. What, what was the pressure? I think part of this may have been uh, having to pay up to keep some of those consumer deposits. Yeah, it's it, you know largely when you look at the company overall. Uh, last last year's fourth quarter of 22 was a high net interest income, and it, it like all the companies, it's come down as rates uh, paid to consumers have gone up, and the and the Fed has quit raising rates. And so, if you look at that, you know that affects consumers most of all because they got 900 consumer segment. They have 950 billion dollars of deposits of which they pay 40. 40, 50 basis points for them. It's a great business. It, the deposit base net business is stabilized. Credit card loans are up. The rest of the loans are relatively flat. Uh, credit costs went up and affect them a bit just because we're building reserves for the credit card growth. But the team's done a great job there. And importantly, 600,000 net new checking accounts, uh, uh, billions of 40 some billion dollars of flows into the Merrill Edge side for the investment side of that business. And you know we feel very good. And they've opened 50 new branches last year and redone, uh, basically finished our a remodeling of all the branches, so they're absorbing all expense and expenses are relatively flat year over year. In terms of net interest income, uh, down five percent. You mentioned the reasons why: just higher deposit costs, as offsetting those higher asset yields. Uh, Thirteen point nine billion was the number that came in. Uh, wh what are you anticipating as uh, as rates potentially will come down? Federal Reserve may lower rates. Wh what are you anticipating in net interest income for the current quarter and the rest of the year? Yeah, so for fourth quarter last year, it was $14.1 billion. And then what happens is fourth quarter of 23 to first quarter of 24, you have one less day. And for that, believe it or not, that's mm -hmm. like 100 to $150 million. So we're saying <laughs> next year it'll be 13.9 to $14 billion, which is consistent with what we said last earnings call. And the interesting thing about that is since you know, the uh, earnings call in October till now, you've had the rate cuts in the market go from three to six. And so, you know, that's a major change in interest rates for 2024, and we still think we have the same trajectory. We're, we're, we come down a little bit in the first quarter, we bounce around a little bit down in the second quarter, and we start to grow out from there. And that stability is really the power of the deposit franchise starting to actually grow. We actually grew deposits quarter to quarter, the third to fourth, and it's very stable, and it's, there's some seasonality in that, but we feel very good about that. And that's all advantage funding, which helps us grow the NII, but it's just a matter of, you know, basically getting loans to grow, getting deposits to grow, but also just taking the effects of the squeeze from the Fed, uh, Fed quit raising rates and the deposit pricing gain for those deposits are rates more rate sensitive. Brian, that, that, that's a lot riding on the idea that the Fed will actually start cutting rates uh, in the first half of the year. And that's certainly what the market seems to think right now. But there are issues that could complicate that. Part of that is, is what we saw with CPI earlier this week. Obviously, PPI today, today showed that producer prices were down, but CPI was a little hotter and more stubborn than had been anticipated. And there are some headwinds out there, things like higher transportation costs. When you look at what's happening with the Red Sea, you saw oil prices up. Uh, four and a half percent may be better than that today on some of those concerns, too. If that starts to trickle back through into the inflationary costs um, and the Fed does not actually lower rates sooner, what does that mean? But from our company's perspective, that actually 
helps a little bit because the, the vast amount of short floating rate instruments we have from uh, on the asset side mm -hmm. and 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 the, the cash of 500 billion almost 600 billion dollars of cash we have that we put with the fed overnight in very short treasuries but you know, let's let's back up and talk about what we see in the consumer maybe and how we think that it, the market moved heavily revealing that the fed should stop they stopped they've said they stopped everybody said they stopped and then they started putting cuts in and the market has you know as i said six cuts in and the fed dot plots have three cuts our team has four cuts Candace browning platts team so if you mix that all together in the end of the day rates not coming down actually help us but the reality is is that everything's setting up for them to be able to normalize the rate environment given that you're seeing consumer spending which for the first part of 22 to 23 was up like double digits it's now down to four or five percent growth in the first part of 24 it's about the same and when you think about that we've been telling uh, thinking watching that for years and years and years and as you look at that that is more consistent with a lower growth low inflation economy if you think about you know the customer the consumer driven economy in the u.s in terms of the amount of impact they have if they're slowing down their purchases that's def that's not inflationary now we have to get through the housing rollover and the inflation statistics you have the issues you're talking about if gas prices kick up the consumer feels that the consumer's expectations have stayed in line so i think there's still some tenuous uh, ground here where we've got to make sure we get a short footing but i think the the consensus view what we see in our customers what we hear from our commercial customers is they they are basically planning for a soft landing which is still a major step down in growth from the third quarter of 23 to the first quarter of 24 you're going to see a growth from four percent plus to about a percent that's a major downdraft in growth and so the fed at some point has to be careful it doesn't go below that and these external factors could hasten them to do more faster i.e cuts or cause them to hold on a little bit longer to make sure the inflation doesn't kick back in Brian, Bank of America stock was up, uh, I think, 1.7% for 2023 versus a gain of about 10% for the financial sector overall. You all have been facing some headwinds, and, and a big part of that is that, that low-yielding, uh, long-dated securities uh, that you've really loaded up on during the COVID pandemic. Um, what can you say about where that stands? I think the paper losses at this point on, on those securities are something like $98 uh, billion dollars versus $132 billion that you've been looking at before. You've been talking about how it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to take these losses. You just let it write off. But when do those things actually write off? And when does it give you more freedom uh, to do other things with that money? So why do we have to invest is that we have a we have a trillion dollars of loans, trillion fifty, and we have a trillion nine of deposits and other other cash and other sources. We have more than two trillion dollars, so we have a trillion two we have to put to work every day. Mm -hmm. Less than half of that is in the held to maturity portfolio, and it has run down eighty, ninety billion dollars from the high and just keeps running off. And that was the plan. We haven't made investments since two thousand twenty-one, but back then when rates were predicted, uh, we had to start extract value, and so. That, that just keeps converting at eight or nine billion last quarter will continue to be that and we continue to be converted over now meanwhile as deposits grow we're building up more and more cash and we're just putting it short term as we did back then so we barbell the portfolio is still there and that that is earning five and so if you look in our materials you'll see that the yield of our of the combined portfolio of a trillion dollars is actually continues to rise every quarter because you have the runoff in the the lower yielding uh, held to maturity and an increase in the asset, uh, AFS and the shorter term stuff. So we'll ride that through, but it gives us a stability in NI even as we go next year. And if you think about what people are saying, they're down a lot next year. We're basically saying if you do all the math, we're down a, a, a couple percentage points for the year, which is which is outperforming others because we have the stability, of the earnings power driven by the deposit franchise. At the end of the day, you know, we've got a trillion nine of deposits, which all in cost is 160 basis points or something like that. It's it's really uh, it's really a fantastic base, but it's our customers and we do a great job to get it. Are you frustrated by um, how the street has been grading at all, just based, based on the stock price itself? Has it been a frustrating uh, situation for you? It, I'd never get frustrated because at the end of the day, if I go out and look at what our company does for our clients and our teammates and our, and our shareholders in society, we generated on an operating basis 29 to billion dollars plus earnings, 15 percent return to tangible common equity, 90 basis point return on assets in a year which had started with people thinking there'd be a recession that turns out a soft landing. It's a completely different environment predict, predicted as your colleagues are talking about bank disruption, all the things that went on. And yet 
We started the year with about 1.93 trillion in deposits. We ended the year with 7 billion less. So all this idea that deposits are going to run out of the system for, you know, as rates got normalized, all that stuff, it, none of it's proved true. And I never get frustrated. We just go out and do what we do is deliver good core earnings and we let the market take care of itself. And if the stock's cheap, we keep buying it. What's your outlook for the housing market, just given how uh, mortgage rates have come down? Well, I think, you know, we're in a process if, we have 15 years of no rate environment effectively and people thinking that was normal and we barely got normalized. We were just starting to get normalized at the, at, you know, 19 and then the pandemic came and rates fell again. So I think it's just going to take a while for everybody to get used to a higher mortgage rate. But you're seeing that start to happen. You're starting to see the as it even gets down a little bit, you start to see the kick up in activity. It's not going to be robust. It's not going to be a big refi activity. But, you know, we're basically getting on home equity loans a, a constant amount of production and on the mortgages, we're sort of running a day place i.e. we're producing the amount that's run, being paid down uh, every every uh, quarter but it's it's not something you know i think it'll be okay i think the beneficiaries of the the half the households don't have a mortgage in, in america so they are renters or are, are own outright the other half that do you know are benefiting by fixed rates uh, we have 40 odd percent of our mortgage portfolio in our books is all floating rates so those rates will start to are starting to move up and we'll see all that play out but in the end of the day people move because they either have more children or something like that, or they retire and they become empty nesters, or unfortunately, uh, the house is sold because people pass away. All those things are still true. It's just the refi activity is lower because uh, people have low nominal rates, which is basically a good thing for American consumers and provides their ability to stay in the game and spend because they've got their mortgage rates, by and large, aren't shifting much. Brian Moynihan, Brian, I want to thank you for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you at the World Economic Forum in Davos on Tuesday. We'll be talking with Brian Moynihan again Tuesday morning on Squawk Box. And uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Mm -hmm. Tyler, we'll send it back over.